Good morning, everyone. Just wanted to welcome everybody to the meeting. Um, as you notice, we're going to have a uh, special visitor today. Uh, <laughs> When uh, the governor does come in, we will interrupt the agenda where, wherever we are and uh, give the podium to him at that time. But until that time, we're going to go ahead with the agenda. So can we first have a, a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Who did that? Thank you. Second. Second. Got it. Thank you. Okay. First, we have uh, comments from the Commonwealth Transportation Board. Mr. Miller, do you want to start? Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Bell. That the, the, the conversation for the day is about the six year plan and works to the six year plan. We have a um, public hearing this evening here. And I think uh, that was part of the, our part of the discussion um, at the meeting yesterday. In addition, um, in future six year plans, House Bill 2 will have a much stronger influence on the prioritization process as to how that. Uh, plan is uh, structured. And uh, the last point that was interesting to me is that uh, the money difference in this current six year plan and the last six year plan is a reduction of about $1.6 billion, which is a pretty significant reduction uh, from last year to, to this, this plan. Thank you, Mr. Mullen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to um, add on to that a little bit, the, um, that, that number does not include any of the funds from the Hampton Roads uh, region, the regional funds. So that's, they're still on track. They're on budget. Um, Dwight, you probably got the latest number uh, we got yesterday. So. It's in the packet, by the way, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that the very latest one, oh, it's a handout, I'm sorry. Your, your agenda packet has the earlier one from two weeks ago. The CTV members always get a report the day before this meeting. <coughs> now VDOT's giving us that, so that's a handout. And those numbers actually lag a couple months, so they're really not fully accurate the way that the system works. Um, but as long as we're comparing apples to apples, we're tracking them fine. Um, I would tell you that um, we, as Mr. Malvin indicated, we just got the plan yesterday. It's about a six inch book. <coughs> So, you know, what all is in it, I can't tell you everything. It will, it's very different from before. And I would ask you all not to get too exercised too early about it. Um, as Mr. Malvin indicated, we have now, because of the uh, change in the law, we have to go through a prioritization process. For any, any um, project in that plan that is not fully funded and has not gone through all the environmental, um, has not completed its environmental work, we have to put that through for prioritization. We haven't even developed a model for prioritization yet. We know the criteria, but the model's not developed. So we're scrambling at the, uh, at, at the secretary VDOT level as well as at the CTB level. So some of those projects have changed their amounts. That doesn't mean that's sort of what we intend it to be, some of its place markers. Because again, we gotta go through this process of prioritization before we can fund anything that is not already fully funded and has not received all its environmental permits. So this is gonna be a bit of a scramble for, for us. Um, I would also tell you that we, um, that Mr. Malvin and, and um, Mr. Ellis and I, yesterday um, brought about $3 million to Hampton Roads for enhancement projects. Um, they include in, in the city of uh, Chesapeake, Suffolk, Virginia Beach, Portsmouth, and Newport News. And basically, we've, we've got fully funded everything that's been applied for. So that's good news, and um, those projects will move forward. Um, he did indicate we have a public hearing tonight. Um, we'll be listening to the public, of course, and uh, we'll keep you informed as sort of where we are in that process. But it's not going to be a normal year, and you're just going to have to, we're bearing with the process. You're going to have to bear with us as well. But we want input, and we want communication. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, for the Department of Rail and Public Transportation, Ms. Good. Sure. Um, first of all, we've been working with our, um, some of you all might be familiar with our Transit Service Delivery Advisory Committee, which is a group set up um, through uh, legislation last year to look at reallocating transit funds on a performance um, basis, both operating funds and capital funds. Um, our, uh, the committee met April 8th to uh, look at the operating allocation and has uh, essentially determined that uh, the 
uh, formula that they came up with that's being applied in FY14 is um, what they'd like to continue using uh, going forward. Um, those, that's not a final finding, but it's just an interim findings right now. Um, the other component of that will be the capital methodology, and we've committed to the CTB that we would look at um, the impacts of that new f way of distributing capital funds um, on all of the different CTB districts um, after the six-year plan is adopted in June. So we'll be going through that effort as well, um, and we'll be sure to keep you updated on that. Um, in terms of the um, uh, Tier 2 EIS for the Richmond to Potomac segment of um, Southeast High Speed Rail, we're wrapping up the procurement process. We're beginning face-to-face um, uh, -face outreach meetings with local stakeholders uh, from Chesterfield to Arlington uh, to both provide an overview of the project and the NEPA process. We expect to wrap these up in uh, mid-June and issue an NTP to the consultant uh, around then as well. Um, as, as, as Shep has mentioned, the six-year plan is out. Um, we're going to be having our hearing this evening here, I believe, um, to discuss, um, uh, to, to get public input on that. Just a few highlights on transit uh, projects that were funded through, um, here in Hampton Roads. There's a total of $36 million for transit projects and programs uh, coming to this district. Um, we've got funds for the purchase of 105 vehicles for over 10 operators that serve the region. About another $20 million in transit operating assistance that's uh, coming to this region as well. Um, you'll see a line in there for funds for fixed guideway projects, which include funding, potential funding for the light rail extension to Virginia Beach, and that's been included in the six-year plan as well. <coughs> funds for um, AVL hardware and software for the Williamsburg uh, area transit authority. We, we're putting up 80% of the funding for Hampton Road Transit's uh, traffic's transportation demand management program. And we've also identified funding for, uh, it's 1.2 million for FY15 in funding to match a um, Tiger Grant application for HRT um, for the draft EIS of extension of light rail to the Norfolk Naval Base. So that's all I have today. Thank you. From VDOT, starter back. Mr. Chairman, I don't have anything to add to the six year program <coughs> hearing tonight. Just uh, two quick updates. Um, one major one is the um, I-64 widening on the peninsula design public hearing is uh, set for April 30th, and that's at uh, Woodside High School in Newport News from 4 to 7 o'clock. So, um, only other note, I think probably everybody's driving the interstate on the south side is seeing the rehabilitation work by all the contractors that's starting at night, and we've worked through a couple weekends on trying to get the concrete patching and the tobacco down on those projects. So, full speed ahead on those. That's all I had. All right, we're going to go to item eight. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, we're not. I did want to mention, though, Ms. Mitchell um, has passed out. Um, <laughs> I didn't pass them out. I'm sorry. <laughs> but we did want to make it known that, that on April 30th, uh, what you talked about, there is a flyer on your desk. And we want people to come out and, and hear what has to be said. Thank you. And that's at Norfolk Woodside, I mean, Norfolk Waterside, uh, Marriott, 531 the 30th, Wednesday the 3rd.
good for you. <laughs> We are going to uh, continue. Uh, the governor's a few minutes out, and we're going to go ahead and start with item eight. Nancy. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and citizens of Hampton Roads. I'd like to present the summary of the fiscal year 2015 budget to you this morning. In the packets under tab number eight, you'll have an overall five-year budget history for the Planning District Commission that includes the numbers for the Transportation Planning Organization as the HRPDC is its fiscal agent. Along with the five-year history in the numerical format are graphic depictions of both revenues and expenditures. As noted on these pages, overall revenues have decreased in the past five years from over a high of $14 million to less than $8 million projected for next year. These reductions are mainly due to the declining federal funding in the Homeland Security programs, both UWASI and MMRS. Also included in your packets is a line item included detail budget, rep reserves, and the local jurisdiction contributions. In comparing the draft budget for 20 year 2015 to the current fiscal year, the HRTPO is actually anticipating a 1.9% increase in funding. Expenditures will increase, obviously, by 1.9% as well, all in pass-through funding to outside agencies and contractors. Personnel costs actually decreased for the TPO as the PDC absorbed more of the administrative costs for those administrative positions. General operating costs also decreased. Costs in this category cover telephones, consumable supplies, printing, travel, training, professional education, advertising, equipment purchases, contingencies. Contractual costs also included are for space, insurance, equipment repairs, legal services, audit services, public involvement, internet connections, web hosting, and so forth. We anticipate continuing to fund our reserves as shown here out of the fund balance at the end of the year once audit adjustments have been posted. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your time. Uh, good morning. I'm here to uh, brief you on the 2014 TIGER program. The TIGER stands for Transportation Investment Generating Economic Recovery, and it was initiated as part of the uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. 
So it's been in effect since 2009, and this is the sixth round then of Tiger. This year, uh, there's uh, the, the, the Tiger program includes $600 million available nationwide. The application deadline is the 28th of this month. Uh, grants are uh, expected to be awarded later this year. And the grants are awarded based on a competitive uh, analysis looking at uh, the significant impacts of the nation, on the nation, metropolitan area, or region. Some specifics about the 2014 Tiger program. Uh, out of the 600 million available, at least 120 million has to be used in rural areas. So that leaves 480 million for anything else. Out of that, up to $210 million can be used for TIFIA uh, loans. Uh, capital grants uh, for TIGER have a minimum grant size of $10 million, except in rural areas where the minimum is $1 million. And the TIGER grants cannot exceed $200 million. However, as you see further down the slide, no more than 25% of the <coughs> funds available nationwide, or $150 million, may be awarded in any single state. So the only way a project could get 200 million would be if it was a multi-state project. Uh, this year, Tiger also includes a planning grant uh, of, uh, availability. There's no minimum for the planning grants. Uh, the maximum for a planning grant is $3 million. And priority is given to projects for which the Tiger funds represent a relatively small amount of the overall funding package. So the, the more funding you have from other sources, the better you can compete for the Tiger funds. Uh, the USDOT staff that evaluates the TIGER uh, projects looks at two different sets of uh, cr uh, criteria. The primary criteria, which includes state of good repair, economic competitiveness. They look at quality of life, environmental st uh, stability, and safety. And then also some secondary criteria, including in innovation and partnerships like multi-jurisdictional or disciplinary, I mean, uh, yeah, disciplinary integration uh, type of uh, arrangements. Uh, if a project doesn't qualify for any of the primary criteria, it's, it's going to drop out before you ever get to the secondary criteria. Uh, based on the past experience from the last five TIGER programs, uh, projects that compete well demonstrate strength in at least two or three of the primary selection criteria. They support key national priorities. They're usually multimodal projects. A lot of times they involve rail uh, and freight, or passenger rail and trans, you know, public transportation connections. Uh, again, the more funds you can leverage outside of Tiger, the better you compete. And you can see some of the other uh, uh, criteria that fit well. Uh, it should be noted that out of the five rounds of Tiger so far, only 5% of uh, project applications actually received a Tiger award. And this year, they're expecting in excess of 1,000 applications. So your handout doesn't uh, include all of the uh, proposals. We received another late-breaking proposal uh, this week. So now we have four project proposals in front of you uh, uh, looking for your endorsement of their, uh, their applications. MPO endorsement isn't required, but it is deemed to be beneficial as part of the application package. Those projects. <coughs> Secretary, uh, Mr. Lane, if you want to do the introduction. Oh, sure, absolutely. Great. Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, glad to be here. I got to sleep in my own bed last night, so that's always a treat for me. But um, I my, my, uh, have the opportunity and the honor here to introduce to you our governor, and I can go through all the different uh, accolades, but uh, what I want to really concentrate on is what this governor has done or is doing for Hampton Roads. Uh, governor McAuliffe, uh, and as a candidate for governor, talked about unlocking the potential and transportation uh, here in Hampton Roads, the economic uh, uh, 
uh, economic development opportunities that exist here with all our natural resources. And to that regard, the things he talked about, he has uh, taken and mitigated the tolls on the downtown Midtown Tunnel. We have reduced, he has led the effort to reduce the fees with Senator Miller, uh, the fees on uh, Easy Pass. Uh, we've looked at the major projects at his direction across the state on 460 uh, and have halted that until we get our permitting in line. Um, he has looked at uh, the extension of light rail in the area, which is one thing he talked about, extending the tide both in Norfolk and Virginia Beach, and we're working to try to be able to do that. But probably the best thing that he led is the effort. His vision uh, was for this region to control its own destiny. Uh, and through, through his efforts, and certainly with the efforts of Delegate Jones and, and Senator Lucas uh, and Senator Wagner, who sponsored the bill, but it was this governor's vision that the Hampton Roads Transportation Accountability Commission give this body or representatives from this body and the region, state and local leaders, the ability to control their own destiny. So I can talk to you about all the other things the governor's doing across the state when there are just as many we were in transportation, but everything that he has said that he was going to do for Hampton Roads, he has done and more. And so with that, I'd like to introduce you his Excellency Terry McCullough, the 72nd Governor of the State of Commonwealth of Virginia. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It's an honor to be with everybody. And I thank Aubrey for that great introduction. And most importantly, you know, when I ran for governor, I spent a lot of time in and out. I spent a tremendous amount of time in the Hampton Roads region. Uh, I clearly understand the potential. I, when I talk about what we could do in Hampton Roads when we work together regionally and not individually, I don't think there's a region in the world that can compete with Hampton Roads. You've got great education institutions, uh, largest naval base in the world. Uh, you've got beaches. I mean, you've got it all here. And if you work regionally, we can get it done. But the problem, of course, as we all know, having spent a lot of time here, <laughs> it was transportation. Uh, unless you unlock that region. I'm good at sales, and I enjoy it. But you're not going to bring a new business here if you're stuck in traffic and you worry about a bridge and tunnel and am I going to be able to make the appointment? Uh, I talk about my son who was, is at the United States Naval Academy, was stationed here last summer in, at the Norfolk base and uh, he said, Dad, it's awful. He said, you know, we couldn't even go out to bars at night because we didn't know we could get back by curfew in time. So, you know, I'm here for my son, first of all. I want you to, I don't want to help him because he's got five more years to give back. But literally, if we unlock this region, uh, uh, our potential is great. So uh, the first thing and most instructive thing I did is I promised you I would appoint a Secretary of Transportation from Hampton Roads, and I did that with Aubrey Lane. So, uh, uh, we'll hit our 100 days on Monday. We have been off to a very fast start, as the Secretary mentioned. I do what I say I'm going to do, uh, and I think you need to hold politicians accountable to do that from the tolls I promised, and you know, we've done some work on the tolls, we've got a lot more work to do, but we have to unlock it. The folks in Portsmouth cannot be stuck in traffic and affects their quality of life and the ability for them just to conduct business. Uh, the Easy Pass maintenance fee, I did suspend construction on Route 460, I will be crystal clear. I will not spend a penny of taxpayer money on a road until it has a permit. Now that may be confusing for some folks, but we have spent $300 million on a road that we don't have a permit for, and even worse than that, we didn't even apply for the permit. That is unacceptable behavior, and I won't tolerate it. So we have suspended that. I've asked the secretary to go back to the drawing board and come up with ulterior designs or if the existing one works. But we have a series of wetlands right in the middle. And guess what? You can't build on them until the Army Corps of Engineers approves a permit, and they won't give you a permit until you apply for one. So we have suspended that. I take this very seriously, and I take the taxpayer's money and our protecting that taxpayer money and spending it wisely very seriously. Uh, I've just left a meeting uh, of a uh, press conference on the port. I think all of you have heard my comments on the port. Uh, I am not happy with the performance of the port. I view this port as such a tremendous asset for us. But we've lost $120 million over the last five years. For several years, we didn't meet our debt covenants. Something wasn't disclosed to me during the transition period. I won't accept that behavior either. So today, we announced five new members of the port board. We got a great new executive director in John Reinhardt. We have such potential with that port. 
I spend 90% of my time on the phone calling around the globe, trying to bring business and export in our products. Just in the last several weeks, I have hosted the ambassador from Japan, from Korea, from Vietnam. I traveled to Washington to meet the ambassador from China. I met with, signed a trade deal recently with the ambassador from France. On Sunday, for the first time ever, the foreign minister of Qatar, huge, huge investors in infrastructure in the United States, was here to see the secretary of state in Washington. I called and said, you cannot come to Washington uh, without, Trump, without coming to the true capital. Uh, of America and uh, he and his whole delegation I hosted for dinner Sunday night at the mansion but I'm working very hard on export deals and what we need to do I need an efficient port to carry that off I've made a public commitment I want our port we want to be the number one agriculture exporter in the East Coast over the course of the next four years that is an ambitious goal we're gonna meet that goal but we need to make sure that the port is fully functional and operational we have a lot of vacant land at the port I want every single piece of that port developed by the time I leave office. We need to bring agriculture export operations in. So I get transportation. I understand it. All the things I talk about in growing and diversifying this economy comes down to transportation. And uh, I look forward to working with everybody in this room. Um, but of all the things I talked about we did are important for Hampton Roads. The single biggest game changer was this HTAC. So, you have the ability now through HTAC to make your decisions. About a billion six over the next 10 years, is that correct, Mr. Secretary? Well, now it's leverage that they choose to leverage. So how much total? That could be about eight, ten billion dollars. Uh, it's, it's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. So, no more blaming Richmond. <laughs> no more complaining, whining, bickering. <clears throat> you all need to get together. This is your decision now. Make the decisions and make them smart, make them quickly, and do them in a manner that, number one, opens up the area for economic development, number two, eases congestion. That is now the mission. And I've instructed our secretary, we will be an integral part and help you in any manner that we need to do. But eight, nine, ten billion dollars is now at your disposal to unlock this region, do what we need to do. Don't look to Richmond anymore and use it as a scapegoat. You are now the decision makers. Make your decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you now get to see who my boss is <laughs> and uh, and uh, why I think uh, we are so uh, uh, great here to have uh, a leader that understands business uh, and certainly is committed to us here in Hampton Road so what I want to do today you heard his charge the, the and I suppose I spoke to you before uh, we at the Secretariat have been charged with uh, standing up or helping you get this uh, HTAC going uh, that is not taking the place of what the TPO does, but uh, many of you will have a, a different hat on when you're in there. Uh, generally, um, the TPO, uh, and I think uh, uh, Dwight would agree with this, you've got the state monies coming in, you're planning projects. Um, the HTAC will be primarily charged with the new regional monies. That doesn't mean you can't take state monies and put on it, and you can't put, uh, you know, use a combination of monies, and we'll go through this. But I think the best way to explain it before I get into these slides is that you are now the developer. HTAC is now a developer. It has the monies and the wherewithal, the authority to develop these, these projects using the resources of the TPO and the, all the agencies around. I see Charlie Kilpatrick is here, Jennifer Mitchell is here from VDOT and DRPT. All of those are at your disposal to help you construct and give guidance. But at the end of the day, you're the developer uh, of these projects, uh, getting the professional help you from the agencies, and I would suggest others uh, as we go through, uh, as we go through this. Now, do I hit the one on the right, Dwight? Okay, great. Look, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the need. Everybody in here knows what's going on, but I will focus on one thing, uh, and that, uh, that is the Port of Virginia. 
And these last two on here, we all know that they are going to be our, our military installations and facilities. Not only uh, getting, to the, getting this uh, transportation right is vital to them, but we understand that part of our economy is probably not going to grow like it has in the past. Nobody can predict the future, but I would think people would suggest to you that increases in military spending here in this region may not be what they've been the last decade or so. So diversifying the economy, and that's why the governor is so passionate about the Port of Virginia. That is one way we can diversify our economy, certainly tourism or others. Um, and, and I'm not downplaying how important our, re our military and Department of Defense spending is. I'm just suggesting to you that if we maintain it, we've probably done a very good job, and we need to diversify into other regions. And as you all know, the second question out of anybody, any business coming is, first of all, where are my kids going to school? And second of all, how am I going to get around? That's really what comes out of people's mouths. So we understand the need here. In terms of the vision, I know this has been expanded by the TPO for, for many years. And the governor, this was part of his transportation plan, uh, creating a world-class transportation system. I, mean, I really believe we have that opportunity here in Hampton Roads with working under, with you, uh, with the resources you control, uh, or the H tackle control, plus the, re the, the, the uh, monies that are still coming to the state. Let me point out that one of the things when I know our legislators here, many of them I see that did this, Senator Norman, uh, Delegate Stolle, that led this, uh, this fight to get this additional monies, House Bill 2313. Um, it was never intended to replace the other state monies. So one thing that HTAC will do is it will totally separate. We'll be able to see how we're, this region is comparing with the state in terms of getting uh, resources. Um, but these are totally separate. Well, the state still controlled by the CTB. These monies are controlled by the members of HTAC. But again, the vision we're all pretty comfortable with, what we have to do to spur, make our region better. And of course, uh, we've talked about um, how HTAC will certainly, hopefully, be a mechanism for that. Um, the problems we face, this is nothing new, are regional in nature. Uh, and I believe if we don't bring the work together as a region, uh, then uh, we won't solve them. I know we'll talk a little bit more about how the voting goes and what have you. Quite frankly, um, one of the largest city here in Virginia is Virginia Beach, the most populous, and I believe, I think I'm right, City Manager Spore, none of the projects that HSAT is considering are in Virginia Beach. Right, so I mean, but they certainly recognize if you can't get to Virginia Beach, you know, they're not being helped either. So that's the type of analysis I think we have to do. Our, we all know that people don't live, they don't live, work, they don't recreate, they don't worship based on political boundaries. Um, and so what we need to do is pull together as a region uh, to try to put together a transportation system that recognizes that. Let me first po po uh, point out, this is not in competition to the TPO. This embraces the TPO priority list. It doesn't mean it has to do them the same way, uh, in, in the same order, and that may be because there could be financial considerations, which I'll get into. Uh, if a project, if the HTAC determines that it may support tolls, and we can talk about whether that's good or bad, but if it does, it has that ability, that's an additional revenue source, possibly that might be done something earlier. So there are both technical and financial decisions that have to come into play. Uh, but it is to create a long-term sustainable program of projects. Now, one of the things that, uh, that my secretariat has worked with VDOT, the P3 office, DRPT, and others, we've put together a financial model that we'll present to you once HTAC has its first meeting. As again, you don't have to use it. But it is a model that shows you that if certain assumptions come true, and if you're able to do, a whole host of, project, of, of uh, individual projects can be started. They don't have to be one, and, uh, one after the other. That would have to occur, quite frankly, if you didn't have the ability to bond or other revenue sources. Uh, sort of a pay-as-you-go thing. So uh, that's uh, one thing that will be considered here. HTAC does allow you um, to consider all the various procurement delivery methods, uh, that including the P3 process, design, build, finance, and design, bid, build, the traditional. 
It is set up to accept the monies and the limitations that House Bill 2313 put on it. So therefore, it is only for road projects. It cannot be used for transit, at least the state monies. But this is set up if you got a federal grant that supported transit, HTAC can accept it. But you cannot use the state monies because by state law for transit projects, that's not what the legislature allowed in, it, in, that, in that. And HTAC is designed to follow the law. And it's hopefully will reduce the cost of construction uh, by bringing these projects forward sooner. Uh, we all know, I think, I can't remember, but Dwight, you've said it many times, how many billions a year we add on by delaying a project. And we know we have significant projects to be brought forward here. Um, HTAC is a political subdivision of the Commonwealth. Um, that had to be done, for, particularly for bonding, since the TPO is a federally uh, organized organization. There was no entity in Hampton Roads that allowed bonding. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, we gave it, the, it with the Delegate Jones leading the way, and again, the others in that, other uh, abilities to procure, finance, build, and operate critical projects in Hampton Roads. It'll be totally up to HTAC what they choose to implement there, but they have the abilities to do that if they choose. There are 23 members. The bill specifically says it has to be the chief elected officer of the governor bodies. Uh, and the 14 localities of the, in the Planning District 23. Uh, the bill does not allow for a designee. It is the mayor or the person in charge. The peep, the one that's in charge of that locality that the people elected. That was one of the big issues that we've always heard that particularly with a P3 project or others, there are officials other than elected uh, appointed people making decisions. That is not the case here. It will always include two senators and three delegates the representatives here locally, and, I, and all of those are voting members. So you will have local elected officials and state elected officials voting together. So again, this authority is not being run by appointees, it's being run by elected officials, people representing the people that these transportation projects will help. Four non-voting members are there, the Commissioner of Highways, Director of Rail and Public Transportation, Virginia Port Authority and a Commonwealth Transportation Board, they're there for advi advice and guidance and to bring resources to you that is needed in that. Uh, as I said, the decisions will be made by voting two-thirds majority vote of elected officials on the commission representing at least two-thirds of the region's population. Uh, that means that the largest city's got to get help uh, if they want to do something. On the other, so that it has to be some building of teamwork. And Delegate Jones was, was adamant that that was the way this was going to be. And the governor agreed that it, it took a combination of people working together to solve these problems. It's authorized to issue bonds and use regional revenues to support debt service. You can bond the regional revenues. Uh, it can also support particular projects if there are tolls or that allow for bonding on those projects. Um, as I said, the, the agencies and the Secretariat will provide um, administrative uh, and technical support along with the TPO. Uh, it will not replace the planning function of the TPO. It will take those planning uh, and it's envisioned that you will develop it. The, the TPO plans it and it passes it on to HT, HTAC to develop it uh, using the resources from the state and others if it desires. Um, and hopefully it'll come up with a prioritized, uh, uh, the prioritized projects, and I think that follows the law of the program uh, that it develops. Um, um, the, the HTPO has developed uh, this priority list uh, with new water crossings, but it can also expand existing water crossing, other problems uh, to address congestion and mobility. I don't have to name the projects. You all know what they are that we're talking about here, the ones listed down below. These have been on our plate for many, many years. And now we have an opportunity to make them come uh, to fruition. And again, it will be how you, you choose, which one comes first, which one you develop, working, as I said, both technical and probably financial uh, aspects will go into that, uh, in that decision. Um, I believe you'll find that they can be delivered within a reasonable time frame. The model we've developed said within 30 years all those projects can be underway or completed construction. 
Um, you may, and that would be based on assumptions. And again, I want to emphasize, the model we give you, you can throw out, but we wanted to give you the stand-up age tag with something to look at uh, to give them an idea of what could happen. Um, the governor has given us a charge, and, 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 and uh, hopefully that um, we can get something started here by the end of the year. I think what's envisioned there is heck, how can we move along 64 widening on the peninsula. That seems the one most developed, but that's again up to HTAC members in that. Uh, but we'd like, uh, it, uh, I think all our legislative representatives would say that they took a lot of political courage to raise these additional taxes, and I think our taxpayers and citizens deserve to see some action. Um, so that's uh, the, uh, I guess, the charge that we all have. Again, we think it is the right vision for Hampton Roads. The timing's right, um, and, and it's going to require strong re leadership. Um, and we'll be there. The CTB will be in a supportive role and guidance, but it is not approving these projects. If you want state monies, we'll have to get them to allocate it, to put on it, in which we envision teaming. But I think Mr. Miller and Mr. Malbin will tell you uh, that uh, the CTB certainly likes to have put money on projects where it's leveraging state resources. So if it sees a locality, and this is what this will be, or an organization that's willing to put up money, uh, that's uh, something that they, the CTB sees as good. That's something that comes out of priority. And we'll talk about House Bill 2 maybe at a later date, but we're going to have to move to prioritization. But revenue sharing and things that, are, that, that, that people are willing to match monies on can move it very high up the list in priorities in the state of Virginia. So uh, Northern Virginia uses that. I would suggest HTAC uh, would use that uh, facility also. So um, really, um, before I get into what our next steps are, I've been a resident of Hampton Roads all my life. And I've been through all the leadership programs that you talk about. In fact, many of you in the room have been through them with me. Uh, and every time we talk about, I could take the one that I went to the, a few years ago and put it the one 20 years ago, and we always talk about regionalism and how we need to do more of it and how we need to pull together. We're better as a, as a whole than individually. Well, I will tell you, this is going to test that resolve because for the first time, this is not about, and I'm not saying they're not important, but collecting trash is important and water. I, I understand. But this is billions of dollars. It can change the lives of citizens in Hampton Roads. We need to pull together to get this done. It's going to be hard work. It is not going to be showing up once a month and voting. It, it really, and I don't mean that, to, I'm not trying to be critical. It's going to take hard work. It's going to have to set up a staff. I know it says you may uh, hire a uh, executive director. I don't see how you cannot hire one with the billions of dollars at stake the bonding, the professional people you're going to need to help to get these projects going, just like any developer would do in getting it going. But I think we have a chance now to pull together as a region and really transform it is what for our citizens. What we will do next, we'll be outreaching, working with the new board, this board. I know Mr. Farmer gave some talks yesterday about HTAC. We want to get this out to our citizens. One of the things that firmly believe in, our citizens need to understand uh, one of the complaints we keep getting was well, just another entity to raise taxes. It cannot raise taxes. Only the General Assembly can do that. It cannot raise taxes in that. But we will work with the, uh, the mayors and chairs in the area, my deputies led by uh, uh, Secretary, Deputy Secretary uh, Grinley Johnson. We'll meet with business groups. We'll all get involved just so people understand what we're doing here. So um, I think we've also passed out to you some tentative bylaws. Again, that again, you can, you can choose not to use them, but we wanted to give a starting point, give the TPO, since many of you are the same people that will be on HTAC, give you a chance to look at it. Uh, and I pledge my support uh, as the Secretary of Transportation and all the agencies here uh, that we will be there to assist you. And we want you to be successful. So, Mr. Farmer, with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, I know it's a sort of a high-level overview, um, but I just wanted to set it up. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Mayor Wright. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, real quick, the bylaws that you passed out here on page one, has uh, it shows a 21-member commission 
versus your presentation shows a 23 member. Must have already made a mistake, haven't we? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, I think it's 23. It uh, I think it's 23, so that is a, that's, that's a okay. incorrect. Uh, sure that was done uh, before the, I think, the Senate and uh, House uh, uh, conferees, and um, they agreed to add each one each, I think, each. Okay. So we'll need to adjust that. Yes, yeah, sir. It showed one Mr. senator and two delegates. Yes, sir. Okay. I think they did that. So. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions? I have a question. Secretary. Yes, sir. Yeah, Mr. Secretary, I'm almost hesitant to, to ask this question, but I'm going to put it on the table anyway. Um, in the 23 member makeup, uh, the first line, I thought I understood what the chief elected officers were, but your, your comments kind of raised the question. Um, with cities, generally you elect a mayor, and that mayor then stays for the term of, of office as the chief elected officer. Counties don't, do not necessarily do that. Um, and particularly, I'll use your county as an example, where every year we, uh, the members of the, uh, the board, actually elect their chairman. Um, and then this cycles through. As you know, uh, and as many people in here have had the experience, you don't learn uh, or you do not learn the uh, ins and outs of the transportation business in a year. Um, you're, you're very well aware of that. It's, I've been a member of this, uh, the TPO now for about six years, and uh, it's only through interactions that you learn about this. So the question I have, with your reference to elected officials, what we do uh, there is that we elect the person on our board who actually serves in the TPO and the HRPDC. Can you give any insight? Does that, is this interpretation? Uh, I, this was a very, very um, uh, uh, discussed topic with uh, uh, Delegate Jones as sponsor of the bill. Uh, and he uh, uh, was adamant. He wanted the elected uh, official, the chief official, uh, Doug Stolle, I think uh, I think I'm right about this. So it would require legislative change to do that. I, I understand your, uh, Ms. Shepard, your comment, uh, but um, I think from an elected uh, point of view, uh, the comment was heard that not the chief executive ought to be responsible for making these decisions, and that was a very big criticism of projects done here in Hampton Roads, that uh, that the mayors. Uh, were not informed, that they didn't understand the terms, uh, and that that was the intent of, the, of this legislation. But specifically, I just want to make sure I hear it coming from yeah. that the chairman of the board of supervisors must be the person. That That's what this law says, yes, sir. That's what the law says. And that it, uh, as the chairman, that uh, person also should be the leader of, that's what he's elected to do. Uh, and that was intended so that uh, never again do we hear that people weren't informed. Or they, if they aren't informed, they will be informed. I don't mean to infer that anything else, but this will ensure that they are informed of the decisions that are being made. They will be making them. Any other questions? Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. We look forward to, to supporting you and your efforts, and thank you for all that this group does. Thank you very much. Okay, so we were up to, in the Tiger presentation, we were up to the second to last slide here. Uh, we have four Tiger project proposals that are seeking MPO board endorsement, so they can include that endorsement with their application packets when they send them into USDOT. Uh, those projects are the Route 58 Hampton Roads Intermodal Connector in Suffolk, seeking $45 million in Tiger grant. The Churchland Bridge Replacement Project in Portsmouth, seeking $18 million. Uh, the Norfolk International Terminal's North Gate project seeking $15 million, and a planning grant request from HRT for the, the uh, draft environmental impact statement for the Naval Station Norfolk Transit Extension Study, and that one is seeking $3 million. This item will be looking for an HRTPO board action under agenda item 13, and the uh, recommended action is to endorse the 2014 Tiger project proposals that were shown on the previous slide. So if there's any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer those. Mr. Chairman. 
Yes, sir. Just a question. In the past, um, we've been criticized for sending up a bunch of projects and ending up not having any of them funded because we can't prioritize what gets funded. Is there an advantage to us prioritizing these four projects in hopes of increasing the success of one of them getting funded? Uh, the, this board has discussed that in the past and it, this determined that since we don't know exactly how the USDOT evaluators are going to look at the projects. We may look at them a different way and prioritize them differently than they would. And, and we didn't want to err on the side of not sending up something that, might, that they might have chosen because we tried to prioritize them here. So that, that's been the decision of the board in the past. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. So, so there is no criteria from the federal government of how they're awarding these grants? They're awarding them based on the, uh, the primary criteria that I showed on the previous slide. Uh, the, the primary selection criteria, they're looking at those five items. I, uh, these projects, at least a couple of them, actually specified how they were addressing each of those five items. In their larger uh, application packets, they're all going to have to show how they're addressing those. They get up to 30 pages to, of, of application material that they, they're allowed to uh, provide for that. And all we have for most of these is a, a couple of pages that's briefly describing the project. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, Delegate Stalia, I think um, what you may be referencing more than not is um, at the CTB level, at the state level, we certainly were criticized for that. And that's because we sort of look at things differently there than the federal government might look at them. In terms of criteria, we didn't have a prioritization criteria before today. So when this region would send us a bunch of projects, which is a huge number, they just sort of threw up their hands. And I think your comments are well taken, but I think it applies more perhaps to that process because the nature of it all being within one state and the region not being able to define which one it wanted. And, and so we didn't always have a good result. So I, I think it may be a little bit different than the, with the federal government. Uh, at least I hope so. Any further questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. You can go ahead with item 10. Uh, thank you, sir. The, the next presentation is on the Transportation Alternatives Program. Uh, the Transportation Alternatives Program was actually established in MAP 21 and it provides funding primarily for non-motorized transportation options. Uh, most of the time we'll see projects uh, for bicycle and pedestrian projects, some, some projects to close gaps in sidewalk networks, uh, and also to uh, enhance mobility to access public transportation. You can even have recreational trails uh, as part of a, uh, an ap a application for a transportation alternative program. The TAP actually replaced uh, some, several previously separate programs that were included in Safety Lou, including the Transportation Enhancements Program, which most of you have heard about, and also separate program for recreational trails and safe routes to school. Here's a long list of typical TAP projects. And again, the ones we usually get are at the top of the list, bike lanes and, and sidewalk projects, uh, projects for uh, converting abandoned rail lines to, uh, to trails for bicycles and pedestrians, and also recreational trails and safe routes to school projects. For 2015, this slide shows the breakdown of TAP funds. Uh, at the bottom of the, the table, you can see $18.8 .8 million is the statewide number. Uh, MPOs and transportation management areas like HRTPO uh, divided up $5.7 million based on population. Uh, also, each CTB district member received $1 million to allocate to any project anywhere in, in, within his or her district. And uh, the CTB at-large members and the Secretary of Transportation allocated the remaining $4.1 million to any project in the state. The TAP project selection process for Hampton Roads can be uh, really summarized in these three major steps. Uh, first of all, HRTPO and VDOT coordinate the application process, and they score the proposed projects based on scoring criteria that were developed by, the, uh, by VDOT and the MPOs in Virginia in a, con in a coordinated fashion. Uh, then HRTPO staff coordinates with our district CTV member to determine what his selections and allocations are going to be. 
and that's helpful information for when the Transportation Technical Advisory Committee takes a look at the projects and the scores and recommends a set of projects and allocations for approval by this board. For FY 2010, uh, for the Hampton Roads Transportation uh, Planning Organization area, there were a total of 10 applications. They were all new TAP projects. And the, uh, the total funding request for those 10 was a little over $4 million. However, for 2015, HRTPO had a total of just under $1.7 million to allocate. So the table at the bottom of the slide shows the four projects uh, that the TTAC has recommended HRTPO board approval of. And two of those projects, you might note, uh, were partially funded by our CTB member, Mr. Malbin. The other two projects were fully funded using HRTPO available uh, TAP funds. Uh, this doesn't tell the entire story for Hampton Roads, however. Uh, the at-large members allocated pro uh, funding to a few more projects in Hampton Roads, and you can see those in the green column. They allocated a total of just over $1 million to, uh, to four other projects in Hampton Roads. Uh, one of those projects, the HRT 88 bus stops, was fully funded. And then three other projects were funded at the 50% level. That represents, by the way, about 27% of those at-large funds, that $4.1 million that was available to allocate statewide. 27% of it was allocated in Hampton Roads. And we're told by Local Assistance Division at VDOT that, uh, that the reason was Hampton Roads had a lot of high scoring projects. Oh, let me back up. So back to this slide, the four projects here with the allocations shown in the yellow highlighted column is what we're asking uh, for board approval for today. And so the recommended action under agenda item 14 is to approve the TAP projects and HRTPO allocations as shown in the tab table on the previous slide. So if there are any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer those. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mill, yes. um, I might just add, um, yesterday in our meeting, the at-large members meeting, um, two of our largest regions did not have um, their priorities in, which gave Ham Roads an advantage. So sort of back, sort of to Mr. Uh, or to Delegate Stolle's point, it was very helpful, Dwight, to have those already logged in. I'm sure Mr. Melvin had the same experience as I did, but we had them, we had them there, we knew what we were into, um, and two of the, the, the other two large regions in the state were not, had not given their, their local recommendations yet. So their, their members were sort of floundering a little bit because we're trying to, you know, we're trying to complement each other. When I look at these, I'm trying to take Mr. Malvin's projects and finish them off, or the, or the TPO's projects and help finish them off. But the, uh, the other members in those two districts did not have that benefit. So I encourage you, I, I want to thank you. Second, I encourage you to continue to get those in up front, even though you haven't voted for them, perhaps, but you, you told us what you were looking at, and that was very helpful. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, uh, another side comment is if you noticed I had a million dollars to spend, I spent 400000 but there were two projects that were outside the TPO that were very meaningful projects and supported well, that probably wouldn't have been funded at all. My, part of my allocation didn't go in that direction. One of them was fish and wildlife and the other one. So I thought that was a very, I used that to balance what the needs were, even though some of it was outside of the people. Mr. Chairman, let me say, uh, the newest member, Mr. Malcolm, and I've known for a long time, John. Uh, took the time out of his busy schedule, came by here for a couple hours, met with I and Mike and staff, and we poured through all the possibilities, and he brought his thoughts, and he listened to where we were coming from based on your staff's comments. So John's already put me in the time as a, as a new member of the CTV. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. We're now at the uh, public comment period. We have. Uh, Few cards, Mr. Ellis, Jane. Thank 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the TPO. My name is Ellis W. James. I'm a lifelong resident of Norfolk, Virginia. Um, there are two things that I noted on the card. One is maglev, which I did address you on last session. And I think I would refer you to Kathy Adams' um, April the 15th article in the Virginia Pilot. And I noted that in that uh, article that the secretary referenced the fact that he felt strongly, obviously, that maglev and light rail should be kept separated. Um, I think I agree with that <laughs> in view of the remarks that I made last time. Now, the second item that I wanted to call to your attention is, and it's ironical that the governor came and addressed the ports issue primarily. Um, we're in a situation where the air quality in Hampton Roads is going to potentially dramatically change with the ramping up of the port activity and so on. And as the growth in coal exports uh, go up overseas, we're going to have a situation where we really, in my judgment, need to have an excellent grasp on what the air quality is. And I'm a little concerned because my understanding is that the only testing station right here in Hampton Roads area that impacts the communities around this table uh, is over at Langley. And I'm not sure that that is going to be sufficient for the increased uh, attention that we need to pay to the air quality vis-a-vis -vis the truck traffic, the imports, uh, everything that's going to be connected with the growth and in, in the activity of uh, the port. So I hope that uh, the TPO will make sure that that traffic component impacting the air quality will be uh, monitored very closely. We've got a lot of seniors and children who live in Hampton Roads, and those folks don't need to get hammered uh, any harder than they are already. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Bruce Drees. Good morning. My name is Bruce Drees. I'm president of the Tidewater Bicycle Association, or TBA for short. We advocate for the rights and safety of cyclists of all types and skill levels. We also seek healthier, more livable communities through bicycling right here in Hampton Roads. It is also my privilege to serve as the current chair of the South Hampton Roads Trail Steering Committee, a cooperative venture among the five Southside cities who are working together in building a continuous bicycle and walking trail from downtown Suffolk to the Virginia Beach Oceanfront. This is being done by connecting existing or planned facilities in each city with the HRT ferry filling in the middle. When complete, the Southampton Roads Trail will connect four out of five of our urban centers and numerous other destinations. I'm here today in support of this very notable endeavor. On the western end of the trail, the cities of Portsmouth, Chesapeake, and Suffolk have about 13 miles of shovel-ready rail-to-trail conversion that could be built today if funding were available. The budget you're about to approve helps further this goal in the city of Portsmouth. We thank you. On the eastern side, the cities of Norfolk and Virginia Beach are in the conceptual phase. Our best and often only opportunities are along the transit corridor across the two cities. A number of cities have already included trails with their light rail projects, including Charlotte, Denver, and Minneapolis. So this is neither a new nor radical idea. Omaha and Boston have similar plans in the works. <clears throat> Recognizing a need for greater understanding in this area, 
PBA's board re recently voted to fund a fact-finding trip to a city leading the way so that officials from Virginia Beach, Norfolk, and HRTPO could learn from the experience of others. We undertook this visit to Charlotte on April 3rd and met with planners and engineers from the Charlotte Department of Transportation. Charlotte's experience is a resounding success. The station access paths on both sides of the Lynx light rail system have proven themselves both as vital connectors to the light rail stations and as key tools in fueling over 1.45 billion, with a capital B, in new private investments since 2005. In the eyes of those involved, the paths are integral components to this success, with the new economic development both exploiting and expanding the paths beyond their roles for station access and active transportation. I invite you to refer to the handout in your briefing packets for a few examples of how this is working. Time does not allow covering many of the other key lessons that we learned while in Charlotte, but from a community advocate's viewpoint, Charlotte proves that the rail with trail system works and it can be done here. Becoming part of the Southampton Roads Trail and the statewide beaches to Bluegrass Trail will benefit the entire region. Thank you for your continued support and the opportunity to speak before you today. Thank you, Mr. G. Um, and this is part of the, uh, your handout is part of the submitted written comment. Thank you. Uh, Judith Brown. Good morning, ma'am. Hello, I'm Judith Brown, president of Hampton Roads Public Transportation Alliance. Um, our group has a vision, as you do, of regional mobility for all generations, moving seamlessly around our region on bicycles, in vans, buses, private cars holding more than one person, light rail, and so on. Uh, we're the group that's sponsoring the event with Director Jennifer Mitchell. We invite you, please sign up and come there. Numbers of you have already told us you'll be there. We're looking forward to it very much. And we also repeat our invitation to you to ride with us on public transit. Our members know the HRT system quite well, and we're willing to give guided rides to you in your area or in your neighboring areas. Our members are going to learn over the next six weeks or so, we're going to ride in Williamsburg, Smithfield, and Suffolk to understand those areas, your tra those transit systems, and how they do or do not connect to HRT system. So again, let me repeat the invitation. Come and ride with a guide. You'll learn a lot. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Item 13, Mr. Farm. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we separated out from uh, the consent item number 13. As you heard from Mr. Kimball, uh, we now have four Tiger Grant applications of working with Mr. Florence and Port Authority and Mr. Harold and his staff from HRT. So uh, their submittals are, uh, are in here. There's a supplemental insert in here because it came in just a couple of days ago. So essentially this action item is to approve all four of the items that Mike had on his PowerPoint, the two that we had originally when the agenda went out, plus the two new ones we received this week. So that is up for action and approval and endorsement of those four projects. So you need a motion now? You need a motion, second. So motion. Second. 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 Raise your hand for the second. second. So thank you. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, motion. Okay. And now the consent agenda. Is that correct? Actually, we've got alternative uh, program also separated out simply for action. There's no modification after Mr. Kimball uh, remarks. So we'll motion second and approval of this advice. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Get All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Now we're at consent agenda. Could we have a motion for the consent agenda? Move to approve the consent agenda as written. Second. Moved and second. All in favor of approving the consent mm -hmm. agenda say aye, please. Aye. 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 Those opposed? The consent agenda is passed. 
on item 16. That's your schedule for the next three months. Next meeting, remember the TPO and the PDC is split. The TPO will meet at 9.30, and the retreat for the PDC will follow that at 11. And lunch, and lunch for the PDC. And lunch for the PDC. Any questions on that? Okay, so the TPO next meeting in May will be at 9.30 to 11, and then the PDC will have a retreat 11 to 1. Okay, so please adjust your calendar support. Correspondence we have on um, in 18? On 17. Two items of correspondence on item 17. Support for the Victory Boulevard widening and support for, uh, both are for the support of the Victory Boulevard widening. Any questions or comments on that? Mr. Shepard, do you have anything you want to say? You and I are already talking. Okay. <laughs> and we have minutes, item 18 of the last meeting. Advisory the advisory committee meetings of the uh, CTAC and the Transportation Technical Advisory Committee. We have uh, also in your in your packet under I guess I may not get ahead of you there is some uh, nineteen here, but there is uh, as you heard me say earlier, uh, Mr. Lawson, uh, I think he's director of finance for VDOT, is that correct, sure. He gives us a uh, monthly report from the HRTF revenue. I normally get that right around the first of the month. That gets in the packet. But I asked, I inquired after Chef you had had get additional new information the day before this meeting. So now Mr. Lawson submits to me the afternoon of that CTV meeting, the latest, and, and one of our financial staff uh, put together the supplemental so that you have actually the very latest information that's only a day old. Uh, and that is in your packet. And we'll continue to do that until the Hampton Roads Transportation Availability Commission is fully stood up as its own staff. So we'll continue to show you these reports and it's in your packet as information. So we ready for you? I think So other than the information for uh, that's in your packet for information only, that's all we have on the agenda. Seeing nothing else, we stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.